Well, let's start with the east end of the yard, which would be across the street from the present day marina. The track that went across, I believe it's Front Street, went in front of the Bayfield Fruit Growers Association building, and there was a small building on the other side of the track from it, and there was a scale out in front, a way scale. Now, back in those days, the trucks and things, we think about Model A Fords and, and Model T Fords and, and that era. Uh, so trucks were really smaller, nowhere near as big as what you see today. They were labeled with tonnage, just like our trucks are today, you know, gross tons or whatever it is. And they would pull up on that scale and they would weigh X. Fruit would be put on, let's say raspberries, and say the truck weighed 500 pounds more when it left than when it rolled onto the scale. And that's how they knew how much tonnage of fruit could be shipped out every year. A lot of it was shipped out by rail also. As you go down the street from there, you would get to the building with the big chimney, what is now Bayfield City Hall. When I was a kid, that was Lake Superior District Power Company, or its predecessor. I think it was actually a Bayfield water utility type building. It is mainly constructed of Lake Superior sandstone. As you're going down towards that building from Many Penny Avenue, when you make the corner, on the right was a two-stall engine house. Not a roundhouse, but an engine house. So let's start from the engine house and work our way west. Today, as you look across the street from where the engine house used to be, you'll see the Bayfield Marina ship store. And then the next thing up would be where Stone's Throw Pottery is now. That, when I was a kid, was the Allwood Manufacturing Company. It supplied veneer-type lumber, if I remember correctly, for the making of cabinetry. And that was shipped out of here, either by truck or by rail also. Between the engine house and what is now Stone's Throw Pottery, there's a big parking lot today. And in that parking lot, you will see, if you walk in there and look around on the ground, a cement curved piece and that was the exterior edge of the turntable. And you're all steam now, so you, you don't think about diesel where you can go backwards and forwards without being turned around. You have to think steam and everything moves slowly. So the turntable was manually operated, which means that your engine crew or your section crew or whoever was available were the ones that turned the engine and coal car around go back out of town. If you looked down into the turntable basin, like looking into a sink, you would see a single rail going in a big circle. It was operated on gears. It was so intricately set up that you take a steam engine and the coal car and put it on there. Two people could turn that by hand. So now you're at Many Penny Avenue and you're still going west and you find this red building. That was the Nelson livery barn, since it's been removed and is what is now the Many Penny Bistro. Now, before we go any further, let's back up to Stone's Throw Pottery Inn. Look south towards the lake to the large orange building called the Bayfield Canning Company. When Bayfield was first founded, it was the era of following the lumber cutting industry from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. We're somewhere in the middle, and we just were part of it. You can see in your mind that when the trees were cut, that we had to find a new way of earning a living here in town. So out in the area just around town became the fruit orchards. There were people that grow beans, potatoes. And the Bayfield Canning Company, when I was a kid, was that orange color. And in the back, I played around with the tin cans while my mother and grandmother worked in the building. You can see the large white doors. That's where many, many tons of beans or whatever were loaded onto freight cars and taken somewhere else. Going up Many Penny Avenue, past the Nelson Barn, the white building you're looking at on this layout was commonly known as the Bracken Hotel. In my day and age, it was the dry cleaners and several other things. Across the street from that little white building was the depot. Now back to the Bracken Hotel and the depot together. In the Bracken Hotel, it was a boarding house. On the first floor was a saloon, and it was called the First and Last Chance Saloon. The reason is that it was the first chance to get a drink when you got off the train, and the last chance to get a drink before you got on. The depot building itself is the original 
that was built. Sometime in its history, there was a fire on the east end of the building in the freight area, and it was shortened. What you see now is the original. There were two waiting rooms, and I'm not sure if women and men were segregated or not, but that's why the two chimneys, there are two waiting rooms. You're on Manny Penny Avenue, going west towards Maggie's. You're at the depot. If you look left, you see bulk tanks. That was the Hogan Oil bulk tanks. Now that would have been Harriet Hogan Johnson's parents that ran that. Continuing then west past the depot now, across the next street, which is Broad Street, you see a red building, which is now being reconstructed to be a little more like it was back then. This is the original, the original color and everything. When I was a young kid, it was owned by Mr. Meldy, and my grandmother's sister married Mr. Meldy. It was her second marriage. Her first was to the Hokinsons out in the San Bay area. It was a grocery store. The little shed roof part of it at the edge of the layout was a feed store. And one time after that, it became an insurance office. The building went through many things. As I was getting older, it was also a place where you could buy bait, all kinds of things for fishing, marine engine repair. That was long before the marina came into existence or the ship store that we already talked about. The buildings across the street to your left from that grocery store all had to do with lumbering way back pre-1942. All those buildings were all taken out probably by 1940s or earlier. The second little building with the lumber stored in it got a second life. It became a fruit building where people would bring their fruit and they would be loaded into refrigerator cars from there. So part of it stayed there, part of it was down here in the Bayfield Fruit Association. I'm not sure, maybe they worked together. Maybe it was the same company owning both, but it's a possibility. Okay, back to the grocery store on the corner of Broad and Manypenny, still going west. It's a truncated building. It's now the Bayfield Lumber Company. Family by the name of Larson owned it. Bob Larson and his wife, Thora. Her nickname was Tula, and I knew their three kids. Bayfield's a small town, and everybody knew everybody. That building is still there, but you got to put in your imagination that it's probably three times longer than what you see. Going across beyond that is a familiar place, and it's called Maggie's. But now going across that street and continuing west, there's a home. That home was Mr. Lee and his wife. Mr. Lee operated a two-story clothing store in part of what is now Andy's Market. The other part of it was the original post office in town. We don't go up that far, but that's where he lived. Then as you continue up towards the end of the U here, there is a blue colored house that is still a residence here in town. Across the street was a residence, and it belonged to a man named Kadat when I was a kid. As you come back down Manny Penny, you see the barrel-like objects and a small wooden building. When I was a kid, that was Standard Oil Company. The gas station was a block up from that grocery store we've talked about. Believe it or not, at one time in Bayfield, there were at least three gas stations, but there were also at least two and possibly three people that actually sold cars here. So you see, everything is related. Those barrel-like things, that was Standard Oil Company, and they had the different grades of, of gasoline in those uh, tanks. And the rail cars came in, they unloaded, it was never shipped out, it always came in. Across the tracks from the Standard Oil bulk tanks was Henry Hansen's coal shed. Bulk cars would come in, not the gondola cars that you see now carrying coal on the, on the long distance from the western coal fields, but this would come in in a boxcar and they had to shovel it out and into that building. Then it was shoveled onto a small truck taken to the residences, businesses that heated with coal. To the left of all that you see a very large facility. That was the R.D. Pike Mill. And across from that, you see a water tower. That was for the old steam engines. What was called a coal car, the back of it was filled with coal because you had to shovel it into the boiler. And the part of that car was also for water. They were called steam engines. So you had to have water to make steam. Up on the hillside, we talked about those houses up on the bulk tanks. You see four houses that look pretty much the same. They're still there today. One of them, the Hudak family lived in, and I believe it was the corner one. Ben Hudak was a longtime lightkeeper in the Apostle Islands, and he was on Long Island for many, many years. Part of our history 
is still here, obviously. When you look at the trackage in this yard, the Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha Railroad came into this place in 1893, I think it is. When I contacted the Chicago Northwestern Historical Society, they said they only had three tracks. The Sanborn insurance maps, which are very accurate, showed what you see here. The main track that came in in front of the depot was Northwestern, as there was that little bow-shaped one going down by the Standard Oil bulk tanks. They also had the one track behind the depot, and the other one that came in past that Lath Mill and Hanson's Coal Shed and down here to the canning company. Now, I say, why are the other tracks, and where did they go, and what happened with them? Well, there was a railroad called the Bayfield Transfer. One of the movers and shakers of that era figured that his brother out in the Dakotas was going to do a lot of wheat shipping through this port just north of town towards Redcliffe. And he had drawn up a, a very large-scale uh, map of the area, and this was all going to be docks and stuff. This was supposed to be a major shipping port. Well, that track ran out into the present marina in a curve from the south side of the engine house out into the marina back onto land over by what is now the, the ferry dock in that area there tracks went along that whole street and then out towards Redcliffe so what we're seeing here is two companies one little fledgling one that never went anywhere but they did carry passengers and freight for a while along with the Chicago St. Paul Minneapolis and Omaha which was at that time one of the larger railroads in the US these two railroads worked together and a lot of logging was still going on north of town and some of that was being brought in by the Bayfield transfer and that line or the Omaha took stuff down to the mill now there are pictures that show boxcars down by the mill when you shipped out fish the rolling stock commonly called a reefer is a refrigerated boxcar that you could put ice in on both ends to keep the car cold they would ship fish out in those cold cars every single piece of rolling stock that was in this yard had to be documented every day by hand using the numbers on those cars. Again, everything loaded off and on by hand, no machinery. If they moved something from one end of that big area to the other end, they had horses. So that's why you got all these tracks here. Well, as they started taking up tracks, because there was not much more industry coming in and they didn't need them, so they just took out what they didn't need and they ended up with what the Northwestern probably said was our three tracks. Stories that I've been told say that, that that line that went down along the mill, down towards the lake, went south of town to what locals call the coal dock. The coal dock, that's where ships come in and unload, you know. It never was that. No bulk freighters came in and unloaded. They went into Ashland and unloaded, or Washburn and unloaded. And then it was taken on a barge over here and unloaded at that dock. That's where the coal came for the steam. That's where coal came for your power plant. That's where it came for your mill. The figure eight is just to help you see the things that went on in the area that brought things into the railroad yard, and it gives you an idea of the area. The railroad was here before you could get here by road. In that era that we're talking about, the only transportation you had was the lake and the railroad. There was no way that you could drive from Bayfield to Redcliffe or from Bayfield to Washburn and beyond. When the road between Bayfield and Washburn was made possible and cars and trucks were running, there was a lot less traffic for the railroad. And David Borth did a book on the lumbering industries, and I think he had one of his books that chronologued this area. So here's what was. There was something before this, and now we got something after this. And what has changed since this all went out? I mean, we probably had two more changes after the railroad was taken out completely. Two more changes in the lifestyle, the way Bayfield survives.